I'm so pleased to see so many people come out for this talk. I was thinking it would be like five people <laughs> who are interested in this um, mindfulness. But I'm in Berkeley, which is you know, why I'm here in part. Um, so, and I am so, so happy to have been asked to give this particular talk. Can everybody hear me OK? Yeah, OK, great. Um, because I rarely get to think about this nexus uh, between um, restorative justice and mindfulness. Um, and um, you know, so I'm grateful to both the uh, initiative uh, for mindfulness in the law and the Henderson Center. Thank you both so much for inviting me. Um, frankly, there, there are these two things that I keep somewhat bifurcated in my public life. Um, but really, um, as Dan was saying, it really uh, mindfulness really uh, undergirds everything that I do in both uh, my previous legal practice as well as in my work in restorative justice. So it was really wonderful to have some time to reflect on the relationship between the two. And it also sort of a kick in the pants to keep working on this uh, law review article that I've been working on forever um, called um, The Law's Middle Way, which is what I decided to title this talk so that it would sort of help move me in that direction. Um, so I want to start with uh, just three minutes of uh, breathing. And uh, come on in. Um, three minutes of, of, of breathing together. And for those of you who are new to mindfulness practices, breath observation, those three minutes may feel like an absolute eternity. Um, I am curious, so how many folks in here have dappled with or even have an active mindfulness practice of some kind? Oh, good number. OK, and so for those of you who don't, um, no worries. It, it, the three minutes feels like an eternity, but it's not. So I'm going to give some really basic instruction. There are many different kinds of mindfulness practice. And the one I'm going to ask us to do today is a breath observation. For those of you who are chewing, maybe you can just clear out that last bite that you're having at the moment. And, um, and what we're going to do is just pay attention to the breath. Just be present with the breath. And you can either do that by paying attention to the rise and fall of your belly as, uh, as the breath comes in and goes out. Or you can pay attention to the sensations uh, on your upper lip or in your nostrils as the breath comes in and out. And um, as I said, it's going to be three minutes. And what I will do is uh, ring the bell at the beginning and at the end. And when you, um, and occasionally I will, my voice will pipe in and just remind you to gently and non judgmentally return to the breath. This is not a time to beat yourself up for how bad you are at it. We call this practice for a reason, it's meditation practice, right? So, um, so I'll just ring the bell, and then in three minutes I'll ring it again, and I'll give some brief instruction in the middle. If you find your mind has wandered, gently return to the breath. without any sense of judgment. Notice if your mind has wandered and gently return to your breath, going in, going out, 
going in, going out. Notice if your mind is drawn to internal or external distractions. And without any judgment, gently return to your breath. Now, if you will, just take a moment to notice the sensations either in the palms of your hands or the soles of your feet. And just sort of bring your attention back into your whole body. And then to the room and yourself in this room. So I'm concerned now that you're eating and now you're meditating, you're gonna sleep through the rest of my talks. So I'll try to be as entertaining as possible. <laughs> um, so I wanna start with a little disclaimer about my discomfort with the term mindfulness. Um, and uh, I tend to talk more about my sitting practice. <clears throat> so I think this discomfort comes from my personal identity as a Buddhist and as an Indian Buddhist. Um, and that mindfulness isn't a term I generally use in relationship to my practice, but, I've, but it's growing on me, and I want to talk about sort of what, what that's about. Um, so the fear around the world, word, I think, comes from a um, concern that when we strip um, ancient practices of their cultural and religious roots, we... Uh, there's two dangers. One is that we are misappropriating, and the other is that we are um, losing maybe what's the very best of it. So, um, uh, and, I, and I feel this about mindfulness and yoga and many things, and what's interesting is that my American Indian colleagues have often said this about restorative justice as well. And so this is some doubly dangerous territory, right, that we're <laughs> treading into here, this nexus of... Um, of mindfulness and, and restorative justice. So I want to take that on up front. I once spoke with Eduardo Duran, who is a brilliant American Indian elder and scholar whose work I really um, just bow down to. And um, I told him, you know, I hear people say, how can you be sitting in circle and holding yourself up as a circle keeper when you don't even know to offer tobacco to the elders and, uh, you know, what direction to pass the talking piece in? And you know, I hear different things about what's the right direction to pass the talking piece in based on whose tradition um, I'm hearing this from. And, um, you know, uh, and I think, like, how would I do that exactly, that offering tobacco and... Um, you know, passing a peace pipe and other things of that nature in, say, an elementary school or a prison, right? And wouldn't it be really inauthentic for me to take on that role? Um, that's, that's not my tradition. That's not where I'm coming from. And I, I, when I was asking Eduardo about this, he said, no, wouldn't the elders, really, wouldn't the elders be happy to know that there are children in Oakland using a talking stick 
to make peace amongst each other without uh, and, and not going to juvenile hall. Wouldn't that make them happy? <laughs> and I said, you know, yes, that's that first, like getting that little sort of blessing from him in doing this work was really helpful to me. But what's even more instructive for me personally in this is, uh, and my greatest guidance comes from my guru, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who, you know, after giving these multi-day esoteric teachings on the inner workings of Buddhist epistemology, you know, at some, this week he's giving talks shortly thereafter called Beyond Religion, Ethics for a Whole World, and um, Optimism in the Face of Adversity. So from these, I go to these talks too, and when I look around at the people there, some of whom may be Buddhist and some, many, most of whom are not, I can see all the joy on people's faces and realize really right there the value of secularizing our sacred practices um, to be more accessible and that there is this wonderful inherent good in a lot of these things. So, um, but I still think it's important to tread carefully. Um, I want to honor the roots uh, that the great practices grow from. And um, so I give this talk with uh, a lot of gratitude to the faithful seekers of the past without whom there'd be no mindfulness and there'd be no restorative justice. Um, and I think it's important also to think about lineage, not just from a, a religious perspective, but also from a really practical perspective. We need to know where some things come from, right? Things come from because if we don't, when they're not working, we can't ask ourselves, what did I leave out in my secularization of this practice uh, that was actually essential to its functioning or to its excellence, right? So we want to make sure that we're not doing that. Um, so I'm going to get into the meat of the talk, or the tofu of the talk, uh, as it were. So, um, so what the rest of this talk is going to look like is that some of you may be restorative justice people, and some of you may be mindfulness people, and some of you may be neither at all, and some of you may be both. So I'm curious to get a show of hands about who all, I got a little sense of mindfulness folks, who all has had some actual experience with restorative justice or has taken restorative justice class here? OK, wow, this is like a really great. And then, um, and who's kind of just, it's OK if you don't want to say, but if, who's, <laughs> if you feel like you need to not say, but if it's, if who's totally new to both subjects, restorative justice and mindfulness? Yeah, I didn't think there'd be a couple, not too many. Right, OK, so what I'm going to do for the benefit of everybody is uh, talk a little bit about what is restorative justice, a little bit about what is mindfulness. Um, and then I was also asked to talk a bit about sort of, um, what um, my path to restorative justice was and how actually mindfulness was what brought me or my sitting practice was what brought me into the, into the work of restorative justice. And then I'll end with a few points from this uh, law review article that I've started, uh, The Law's Middle Way, about how these practices of mindfulness and restorative justice actually dovetail very nicely, if not actually buttress one another. Um, so let's start with restorative justice. What is restorative justice? If nothing else, it is a paradigm shift. It's a call to a paradigm shift in the way in which we think about justice. And I'm um, paraphrasing Einstein here, but um, he said something to the effect of, you can't solve a problem if you continue to think the same way you were thinking when you created it, right? And so how were we thinking when we created our school discipline processes with their incredible racial disparities and their school push out and the school to prison pipeline and then the prison system itself and our juvenile justice systems, wildly ineffective, running rampant with racial disparities again and um, you know, really good at increasing recidivism rates really in many circumstances. So um, what, 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 were we, what were we thinking? And I think what's instructive here is Howard Zare's three questions, uh, which is, um, what he wrote about, I think, first in his seminal text called Changing Lenses, and he's, he's considered the grandfather of restorative justice. And um, so he's written many books on the subject, but his first one, I believe, was called Changing Lenses. And he posed these three questions, uh, which in our traditional system of justice, how we are thinking is what law was broken, who broke it, and how do we punish them? So restorative justice asks us to ask a completely different set of questions. Those, those questions are, what harm was done? What needs have arisen? And whose obligation is it to meet those needs? And you can see how that shifts the entire thing away from punitiveness into problem solving, really, and starting temporally with the person who was harmed rather than focusing initially on necessarily the person who uh, has done the harm. And while, of course, in restorative justice, we concern ourselves with 
both as well as with the community, that shift is really a radical difference in the way in which we conceptualize the work um, around dealing with crime, particularly, and school wrongdoing. So Howard uh, defines restorative justice, again, I'm paraphrasing, as a process to involve, to the extent possible, all those who have a stake in a specific offense to um, identify harms, needs, and obligations, and to put things as right as possible. OK, so uh, that's a tall order. But there are some restorative processes that are actually quite good at doing that. And when he talks about a continuum of restorative processes, from those that are pseudo to non-restorative, uh, all the way to fully restorative, and he writes about this in his little book of restorative justice, um, there are some processes and practices that I personally find are really effective at keeping us on the fully restorative end of that continuum. Those to me are the community containers that allow for face-to-face -face dialogue between the person who was harmed and participatory decision making, including the person who was harmed and the person who's been harmed, um, where the community supports the person who's harmed to repair that harm right, to the person. And that, that the person who was harmed, those are victim identified victim's needs that are really driving the process. So that, to me, is when we're really operating at the most restorative end of things. And that's, that's where I'm excited about restorative justice when I get to participate. I'm excited about any time I get to participate in any restorative process. But, um, but when, when I'm really watching people come up with the solution themselves, held in a community container, that really, that gets me excited about what could we be doing instead of the way we are doing it now? Um, so there are many, many practices for achieving those goals. Um, circle processes, family group conferences, what we call here in Alameda County, there's a program out of Community Works, uh, which um, is, we call it restorative community conferencing there. And that's um, the program that uh, I started with my Soros Justice Fellowship when I was at Arjoy Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. And then I moved to Community Works and that program continues on and is actually fully funded, keeping, um, hopefully keeping 100 kids a year out of the juvenile justice system, giving them an opportunity to meet with the people that they harmed. Um, and repair the harm to them. So also victim-offender dialogue is another uh, thing that's often done in crimes of severe violence. There, Jack Dyson is somebody who's here today who does that work. It's wonderful work. Also as a reentry model, there's circles of support and accountability, which has um, been shown to be the most effective model in uh, reducing uh, re recidivism amongst uh, registered sex offenders. And so there's some work coming out of Florida that's uh, really promising in that regard. These processes are used in schools and communities in lieu of our juvenile justice system, in prisons, post-release. Uh, you can pretty much use it anywhere. Um, so that's my super brief intro to restorative justice, and I'll be talking a little bit more about sort of it again in the nexus of the two. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about what is mindfulness. Mindfulness also calls us to a paradigm shift, and to my mind, an, a far more radical one even than restorative justice. Um, and, um, you know, very simply put, Thich Nhat Hanh describes it as just being in the here and now. So for me, in my experiences of mindfulness, it's about those few, very few moments in my life when I'm able to be fully present uh, with non-judgmental at attention to this very moment, now, here. Now, I have a watch uh, that's really helpful in this regard. It was designed by Thich Nhat Hanh, and on the face in the center it says it's, I-T apostrophe S, and around the edge, um, instead of the hour, it says the word now. <laughs> so I love this watch. <laughs> My husband pointed out to me that um, it's a great watch because it's accurate even when the battery is dead. <laughs> Um, so, like restorative justice, there are many, many practices for being in the here and now. Zazen, Vipassana, in my tradition, Tibetan Buddhism, there's Mahamudra and Dzogchen to achieve single-pointed concentration. There's basic breath observation. There is what some people call just sitting. I love that. <laughs> when you're thinking, just sit. <laughs> and when you are you know, imagining the future, come back to just sitting. 
You know, I just love that expression, just, just sitting. Um, there are also you know, ways to do it, including your body, uh, which there are walking meditations, which I just started doing a couple years ago, and I love this walking meditation. It's extremely slow. Um, and, and just paying attention to all the muscular movements and the sensations on the soles of your feet as you are lifting one and placing the other. And, in, and the, particularly in the physical uh, aspects of, of mindful practice, I find that I am able to get that, that message drilled home so loud and clear, which is that your mind can actually only be in one place at, this, at, at one time. So when I am paying attention to this foot lifting and I'm starting to notice that this foot is going down, I can only be thinking about one foot at a time. And that, that really reminds me that when I'm texting while I'm trying to listen to my son tell me about his day or whatever, that's not actually happening. I'm either not texting well or I'm not paying proper attention to my son. And uh, so these physical ones, the mindful eating, I find astounding. So this is the practice of picking up the fork, you know, noticing the feelings and the muscles in your hand, feeling the, the tines go into the food as you're lifting it, noticing that you're starting to salivate, you know, feeling each, but chewing until your mouth is empty, swallowing, noticing that you have habitually picked up the fork again before you even finished the bite that's in your mouth, you know, putting your arm back down, chewing, swallowing, you know, it's really, these are the, these are the physical practices. There are other ones um, such as and so the circle, uh, the calligraphy, the big uh, circles, those big black uh, calligraphy circles, you may have seen those. Um, and also there are flower arranging processes that are, can be done through mindfulness. Um, in my tradition, again, sand mandalas, where I've watched people make these, use these little metal implements to grain by grain of sand, create these unbelievable um, intricate designs that take days and days to make uh, all done with incredible attentiveness to the very moment of each little motion. So indeed, anything and everything could be done with mindfulness, including the practice of law and being a law student. Um, for me, uh, the more mindful my legal practice became, the more and more I was getting pulled towards restorative justice. And um, you know, I think that in the end, it's what I could call right livelihood and um, what I'm thinking of as the law's middle way. So in reality, this mindful thingness, mindfulness thing is really beyond words. And um, it's what we did in our opening time together to the best of our abilities to be non-judgmental, to uh, just observe the present moment um, and just be aware of that moment, the now. And um, what I'd like to do is just revisit it again for just a moment before I move on and uh, have us just be again in breathing for just one brief moment before I continue on with the talk. Let's just take a moment to again return to the sensation of your breath coming in and out. Either your nose and the sensations there, or the gentle rise and fall of your belly. This is also exciting to have a moment of silence in a law school. <laughs> I'll say I do that for myself in the middle of talks too, because it really just helps me. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for giving me that moment. Um, 
So I was asked to share a little bit about how my sitting practice actually brought me to restorative justice. So during and after college, I was a victim's advocate, working primarily with battered and sexually abused women and children in shelters and on hotlines. And then um, I moved to Bombay to work um, with enslaved HIV-positive sex workers and their children. And what was going on for me personally during those years was that I had an amazing amount of anger. I was an extremely angry, angry person. If you ask any of the few friends that I have kept from those days, the saints that they are, they'll say it's true <laughs> and that I was very angry. And um, you know, this, what was this anger, this anger that I was sort of projecting onto, and, and some of it you know, was, was accurate at pimps, at dirty cops, um, who were involved in the sex uh, trade in, in, in Mumbai, then Bombay. Um, and, um, you know, unfortunately, it kind of all men in general um, was a lot of this anger. Um, it was that I noticed that it was uh, doing more harm than good to myself and to my work. And so underlying all of this was my own unresolved personal trauma uh, at, and my rage at my father for having sexually abused me throughout my childhood and adolescence. And this, this unresolved stuff <laughs> was coming out in not just rage at everything around me, but also blinding migraines, debilitating uh, stomach problems, just all kinds of personal health issues. And also a slew of failed relationships in my wake. So um, just a few months before I was starting law school, and it occurred to me, maybe I'm not ready to go to law school. Maybe law school is not the best <laughs> environment for me, given my psychological makeup right now. And I was really confused about what should happen next. I took a break from the work that I was doing a terrible job of doing, um, and I um, ended up backpacking and landed uh, in the Himalayas in, in, in Dharamshala. Uh, which is where the Tibetan government in exile is. And during that time, I think it was curious maybe in the early 1990s to see an Indian American young woman in her early 20s with a backpack and an American accent, and you know, I was just in my ratty jeans. And um, there were some Tibetan families that found me amusing and would take me in and have me over for dinner and whatnot. And so during dinner, I would get to hear these unbelievable stories of the most horrific, I would ask about their personal lives. And I was trauma girl, and I wanted to hear everyone's trauma all the time. And so I would ask all these questions about what, um, you know, what was it like escaping, and what, you know, and they would tell me the most unbelievable things about, you know, deciding to whether to leave their their dead children's bodies who who had died from frostbite on the way over the mountains, et cetera, or whether or not to carry them and. You know, just unthinkable things, watching monasteries being raised, um, missing relatives who were monks um, when entire monasteries were gone. I mean, just unthinkable trauma. And then a couple minutes later, the subject would change and they'd be laughing and chatting amongst themselves and I was still sort of in, just in a ball of rage. And so I asked them, how, how are you happy? You know, like some of you just, this was like four years ago that you're talking about and you're sitting here laughing and enjoying yourself and they said, well, we practice forgiveness, which I thought was insane, and <laughs> um, shared my feelings about the insanity of the forgiveness of unforgivable acts. And you know, um, and they said, so you know, being wise folk uh, that I chose to connect up with, they they realized that I was again projecting, and um, asked me, so what are you so angry? What's going on with you? You know, what are you so angry about? And so um, you know, I told them, and they were like, oh. You know that doesn't that doesn't happen in our community. We don't know. We don't know about that sexual abuse stuff. Maybe you know we don't. That doesn't happen in our community. I said well, actually it does. It happens in everybody's community. Um, and then they said, you know, you should ask His Holiness. You should ask the Dalai Lama. What do you what do you what do you what do you suggest about this interfamilial abuse and how does forgiveness look like in that context? And I said, well, how does one ask the Dalai Lama these questions? You know, sure. I said he's probably busy. You know, I'm not gonna <laughs> bug him with this. And so they were like, no, write him a letter. You know, so I wrote him a letter. And I, at that point in my healing journey, I couldn't even put it in writing. I couldn't even say, you know, my father sexually abused. I was just starting to talk about it. And um, so instead, what I did was I wrote him a letter. And, it, and the question, really, the, seminal, the, the, the central question in, in that was, how do you work on behalf of abused and oppressed people without anger as the motivating force, right? 
And so I dropped this off at his monastery, and they said, come back in a week, and you'll get something. I figured he'd give me a blessing cord or something, you know. And so I come back a week later, and I'm ushered in, and I'm ushered in further, and I'm ushered in all the way to the desk of his private secretary, who said, his holiness is really moved by your letter. And I don't remember what the cause was. There was, like, political turbulence or something in Assam, rain in Assam, and he couldn't go to his scheduled trip. And he's like, would you like to have a private audience with him on Tuesday? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah yes. <laughs> Yes, I'd like to meet the Dalai Lama on Tuesday. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm totally unprepared for this. And I show up, like, in my ratty backpacker clothing. And the picture to this day cracks me up that I show up to meet the Dalai Lama in this, like, nasty backpacker clothing. But I, you know, so that hour was um, probably the most important hour of my life. Absolutely. Yeah, probably. That hour was the most important hour of my life. Um, and... Um, it was definitely the most valuable in terms of my personal transformation. For the first time, among many other amazing things that we talked about during that hour, uh, that was the first time that I admitted that when my father, when I was 16 years old, and my father was, was dying, and he was dying for a while, he had heart attacks and strokes and et cetera, and they kept sending him home from the hospital and then taking him back, and it was just this terrible, tortured thing. Um, and I hadn't told anyone, including my mother, um, that my father had sexually abused me. Um, so. Um, the last time he was home, and he went into cardiac arrest, and he stopped breathing, and I had just taken a CPR class, and for God knows what reason, at that time, I couldn't really um, figure it out. I jumped onto his bed, and I started doing CPR on my father, willingly put my mouth on the mouth of this man whose death I had actually prayed for. So, you know, I just, and after, he passed away shortly thereafter, and I was really tortured by this. Like, why did I try to save my oppressor? And da, da, da. I was just really eaten up by it. But I also felt like there was a valuable question in there. What had been that instinct to save this person um, who had made my life primarily miserable <laughs> for the first, you know, 16 years? Um, and so, um, what I noticed during this hour with His Holiness was that it was, um, it was his unbelievable compassion in listening and his capacity to really just, I felt like I was the only person in the universe. And there was this literal like physical feeling of compassion coming out of him. And it made me feel sort of more held and stronger than all the years of therapy. Nothing, I don't want my therapist to hear about the wonderful therapist, but also, that it just nothing pales, everything pales in comparison to that experience of having been fully listened to with full and complete compassion as I'm explaining this to him. So, um, so, so I asked him, so you, you know, you've forgiven the Chinese for the Chinese government for this unbelievable ongoing atrocities. How do I forgive my father? You know, seems like a, a, a smaller task. And he first he put aside this notion of, of being comparative about these things, which of course he would. And then he um, and then he asked me a most challenging question. He said, Do you feel you have been angry long enough? <laughs> which I was not expecting. Very challenging question. And so I sat there silently for a moment. And I surveyed anger's impact on my life and on others and said, yes. And so then he gave me some practical tools for forgiving seemingly unforgivable acts, which I will share with you all now. Um, the first one was that he noted that my mind was completely out of control, <laughs> that I had this sort of monkey mind run completely amok. And um, so he suggested that anger was really, this level of anger was a sign of a mind that's just going crazy and you need to rein it back in. And a great tool for that would be meditation. And so he said, so the first thing, meditate. I said, all right. And he said, second thing is, you want to find some way to align yourself with your enemies. And I, I started laughing at him. And I said, you don't understand. I'm about to start law school where I'm going to be a prosecutor, where I put those battering uh, 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 expletive, expletive behind bars. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not really sure about this aligning myself with them thing. And so he found this really, he's patting my knee. He's like, okay, okay, you just meditate then. Just, just meditate. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my, my then boyfriend who was with me, um, uh, in that, I called him, he was still in Bombay, and I called him, I said, you gotta get up here right now, We're at the audience with Dalai Lama on Tuesday. He's like, what? So he came up, he, he remarked afterwards, he's like, I said, so what did you think? You know, it was amazing as we left, and he said, I can't believe how much you cursed and you cried. 
<laughs> and I, but you know, what's amazing about His Holiness is when you bring your whole self, and at that time I was a cursing, crying person. <laughs> that uh, I'm still a cursing person. But um, at that time I was a cursing, crying person, and that's what I brought, and he responds to that authenticity, you know? So um, anyway, so I immediately went and sat a 10-day Vipassana uh, meditation course, this island 10-day sit. On the ninth day, of which they teach this wonderful practice called metta bhavana, which is um, this process of um, uh, you know, loving kindness, basically, is, is a good way to translate it. And, and during this experience of, of learning this metta bhavana practice, I had a spontaneous experience of completely forgiving my father. And in the couple of weeks and, and a months that followed, I kept testing it. I think of like the worst thing he ever did to me, and, and no, no anger. Just nothing would come up. And what I also noticed is that, hey, no migraines, no stomach problems. And they've been gone to this day. And now, when I think about my father, and I think about who, who he was in the world, I am flooded with compassion and concern for you know, what his afterlife might have looked like and where he may be today. And, um, and I really just only wish his spirit peace. So. That was a big, big change. And then the next thing that happened was that I started law school, which was, this was a really huge shift. Imagine all of this, and now I'm sitting in like torts and evidence, and not evidence, of so Civ Pro, right, first year. And um, about a week into it, I'm, I'm sitting in David Rudofsky's, uh, he was my crim law professor um, at University of Pennsylvania. I'm sitting in his office hours, sobbing my eyes out and saying, I really have to drop out. I don't know what I'm doing. I was supposed to be a prosecutor. I don't want to send anybody. I don't think prison's the answer. I don't know what I'm doing. And, um, and I really hate civil procedure, <laughs> and I just don't want to do any of this. And so he said, you know, hold up. Don't drop out. You know, there are other things you can do with your life than be a prosecutor, even given that you've been this victim's advocate all these years. You might, you might want to consider, for example, defending women who kill their abusers be a defense attorney. And I'm like, oh, OK, OK. Well, nobody told me at that moment I got all excited about that I was going to have to defend everybody in the process of getting to be so you did. So of course, like the, one of the first cases when I'm at my clerkship is like this, well, I wasn't defending at the time, but like this humongous child pornography case where my job is to sort through like hundreds of pictures of children being raped and all these different positions. I mean, it was like, and at every turn, I kept noticing, oh, my forgiveness is for real. And whenever I'm freaking out, just come back to the breath. Just come back to the breath. And, um, and then, of course, the first trial I assisted with was this terrible rape case of an eight-year-old. I mean, seriously, it was like, let's just throw it all at her up front. And again, I continued to return to the breath. And as I developed these skills it was necessary to represent everybody, not just women who are killed, accused of killing their abusers, I um, came to realize that I could very well represent people who had killed, people who had, um, I wanted to give them my best, the very best representation, and they deserved it, and to be in the presence of someone who could look at them as a human being and with full compassion for the totality of their story. So um, in preparation for my second audience, I, um, let me just check my time here, I, um, I had a second audience with His Holiness in 2000 where I wanted to ask him sort of forgiveness, you know, 102, I was ready to like move on to the next set of questions. And, in, in preparation for that, His Holiness's private secretary, who was unbelievably helpful to me during those years, suggested that I read this book called The Golden Yoke, Y-O-K-E. And it is a very dense um, book. It's wonderful by a woman named Rebecca Redwood French. I believe Charlie Halpern, um, who can't be here because I think he's doing a 10-day sit today right now, which is so great, um, is uh, he knows her. And uh, so it's a book about, she's an anthropologist and an attorney and uh, wrote this book about sort of the history of Tibet, the Tibetan legal system prior to Chinese occupation. And it is, as I was reading it, I mean, there were all of these things that just spoke to my heart, like uh, people coming to consensus about the facts before even really going to, um, to the courthouse doors, or that victims identifying their needs and the obligations of people who have harmed being held directly responsible to those needs, or uh, notions of things like reconciliation and even forgiveness as being a part of what is encouraged by the legal code. And so I was completely blown away by this. I'm like, how do we do this in the United States? And I started talking to my friend Susan Marcus about this, and she said, you know, you're talking about restorative justice. And I said, what's restorative justice? And so I started to read 
everything I could about RJ, and um, and I ultimately ended up taking every training I could find on restorative justice, and started teaching college and law school classes on restorative justice, and then applied for the Soros Fellowship and started this program that, again, is operating today um, at Community Works. And mm, what I, um, I'll just tell you a tiny bit about that program. It, it really is a model, uh, modeled after the New Zealand style family group conferencing, excuse me. And um, it really has, I think, incredible potential to revolutionize our juvenile justice system and our criminal justice system, ideally someday, um, where we hold young people directly accountable to the people that they've harmed and create space for the kind of uh, storytelling that we really want young people to learn how to do about what they have done and what they need in order to help make this right, and for victims, first and foremost, to say how they were harmed and what do they need and how would they like to see it repaired. Um, and so it's it's really, um, it's a remarkable program. And um, again, keeping 100 kids a year out of the juvenile justice system for serious crimes like burglaries and arsons and teen dating violence and um, car theft and uh, other serious assaults, and the, particularly the youth on youth assaults. It's amazing to bring these young people together, and it's all completely voluntary, and, and pretty much everyone agrees to do it. Um, it's a really beautiful process, and sort of, I think, the best of what justice can actually look like. So um, today, as the director of the National Council on Crime and Delinquency's Restorative Justice Project, what I'm seeking to do is replicate that sort of everywhere. <laughs> I'd like to see us all do it this way. And slowly but surely, uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, I think we're going to see a sea change. Um, and the San Francisco District Attorney's Office is already interested in replicating. There are several places in Southern California that are also interested. So. I want to get a little bit to um, why this talk um, is titled The Law's Middle Way. And in part, it's because this whole journey has been, um, has been about um, you know, this nexus. And I, I don't really name it, and I'm really glad that I was, again, given this opportunity to do so. So um, here are a few things. That, so that law review article is more talking about less mindfulness and more sort of the dharma, which is sort of the more Buddhist way of saying it. And so there are a few more Buddhist elements in this part of the talk. Um, but again, I do think they can all be secularized in ways that are of benefit. So <clears throat> bodhisattvas are people who vow to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And the bodhisattva ideal is really about having this equal compassion for all beings. Likewise, practitioners of restorative justice should have equal concern for everyone in the circle, victims, community members, the person who's harmed. And so I see a real strong parallel there in the way in which sort of my faith and my path really um, buttresses my capacity to sort of do this restorative justice work. So instead of being sort of impartial mediators or when I was playing lawyer, sort of very partial sort of advocates for one side, um, restorative justice facilitators and circle keeper, keepers are equally partial, equally partial to the needs. And so things take longer <laughs> to get done in some ways, but this equal partiality is so critical to um, creating those containers and those safe spaces in which people can really get to the roots of what this harm was about and how to really heal it. I also find the talking piece itself, for those of you who've been in circle, you may know that there's a talking piece that gets passed from person to person. Only the person holding it is speaking, um, and everyone else is given the instruction to listen deeply and from the heart, right? And to suspend judgment is usually one of the values that the group agrees upon, and to really just non-judgmentally listen. This practice in and of itself, there are times when I leave circle and I feel like I have just meditated for four hours. When you are just listening deeply, if you're paying this very close attention to what each person is saying, um, and uh, that, that to me is, in and of itself, feels very much like mindfulness. Um, this not thinking about what you're going to say next and learning to just sit uh, and absorb what you're hearing is a very challenging thing, especially for lawyers and people trained as lawyers and law students when all we're doing really is thinking about how we're going to tear the other side down and what mistakes they just made and what they said, right, and where the holes where I can either say it smarter or <laughs> uh, correct it or whatever, right? Um, 
So that mindful, deliberative communication uh, is really, to me, at the basis of what best restorative justice practices look like. Um, when it feels like it's another way in which mindfulness comes in handy for me is when it feels like it's taking forever for the talking piece to come back around, uh, I really <laughs> rely on my breathing. <laughs> so like I just come back to the breath. So I use breath observation, especially when it's going excruciatingly slowly. Um, another connection I feel is that we, we have openings in most restorative processes, and I often use meditation as my opening. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I think, I should get creative, and I watch all these other circle keepers do these great openings. But for me, I just kind of bring this thing along, and I use it pretty much every time. Because I find it really marks the difference in the way in which we are being out there in the world and the way we are being in circle. So I, I pretty much open with meditation. Um, I did a... 18-week forgiveness circle with Jerry, who's here uh, today from Community Works, uh, with a group of men inside San Quentin, no, in San Bruno facility, uh, San Francisco, out of the San Francisco Sheriff's Office. It was a jail, and we did a circle on forgiveness, uh, where we explored different aspects of the topic forgiveness. And we opened and closed, I think, right at Jerry, every session with meditation. And it was incredibly effective in getting these guys, all of whom are labeled violent offenders, all of whom have much uh, that they could benefit from forgiving themselves for uh, much that they have done that um, you know that uh, may or may not be deserving of forgiveness depending on how their victims feel and much has happened to them that you know they wanted to grapple with around the concept of forgiveness so we really marked that space uh, with meditation at the beginning and end um, a little piece that's not so much about restorative justice and more about the practice of law generally was that I used to volunteer for this organization called the Insight Prison Project, which is a Buddhist organization that helps um, prisoners across the world, actually. And I would occasionally do a pro bono case um, as a, uh, just as a, as a, you know, as a, a way of being of service uh, for lifers uh, who are Buddhists. And uh, one of my favorite things was in prep for these lifer hearings, because these guys were already Buddhist, that we could sit and meditate together. So I would do this practice called Tonglen, which is this practice which is also called the giving and taking, which you're breathing in somebody else's relative suffering, and you are breathing out your relative good fortune, opposite good fortune, right? So in a sense, I'm noticing how nervous this guy is and how he's really discombobulated, and he's really going to blow this hearing. And so I'm breathing in. Um, you know, his inability to um, advocate for himself. And I'm breathing out my relative level of comfort with speaking in front of, you know, parole board commissioners. And at the same time, sort of talking him through some basic breath observation that's helping him calm himself and, and be prepared. And he would do a great job at these hearings. He always rocked them. Unfortunately, he never gets <laughs> paroled. But I wanted to share this with you. Um, this is something that he drew for me. This is a picture of Vajra Sattva. And uh, he didn't have any um, art supplies. He just had a couple pens. And what he would do for the colors on this thing um, is that he would save his Skittles and his M&Ms. And he would uh, rub the, the ink off of them. And um, so when I took this to get it framed, the person said to me, so what is, is that medium? <laughs> and I said, it's Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so I, I love this. And uh, so he's like, yeah, I think we're going to need some extra special museum glass to protect that. So it's a really awkward medium. But um, that was his gift to me for um, doing, this, um, doing this representation. And finally, um, I want to tell you a little bit about a case uh, that I worked on last summer, um, two summers ago now. Uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, a young man um, killed his fiance. And he was 19 years old. He shot and killed his fiance. And the girl's parents were really invested in restorative justice being the way in which this case was resolved. And over the course of a year, we ended up having this amazing opportunity to have a restorative plea dialogue inside his jail. Uh, prior to him entering a plea, we, we gave an opportunity for the victims to tell their story about the loss of their daughter and to ask the kinds of critical questions that our trial processes never allow, like what were my daughter's last words and you know, how did we miss this in your relationship? And to get into the deeper questions of uh, what can be done to honor her memory now that she's gone. Um, that's not something I ever saw happen in a trial <laughs> and something that we were really able to do in these five excruciatingly beautiful and excruciatingly painful hours that we spent in this restorative dialogue. So um, 
I wouldn't have survived that without my meditation practice, both in the prep time leading up to it as well as in the actual circle itself. And I have one memory of visiting his parents and going to the bedroom in which he had killed her. Uh, he was in jail. And I went there, and I was sitting, and I did my practice in that room. And uh, just left my heart completely open to the totality of that story. And when I finished up my meditation, the phone rang. It was the district attorney who was really angry about some aspects of things and wanted to make sure that we were taking this very seriously. And, and he had some legitimate stuff. And it was really, I just stayed on the cushion. And it was really interesting to be talking to this man, just listening and breathing and trying to be creative from that space of just remaining sort of in, in my meditation posture in this room in which this young man had taken this girl's life. So um, it was really just, I can't uh, thank anything more than my meditation practice for that. Um, and just some quick closing thoughts. So it is my practice that uh, is the, um, holds, holds all of my work together, really. And uh, since 1996, I've sat about six different 10-day sits and maintain a daily practice. I know that people think it's impossible to do this. You can make time. This is my little you should part of the talk. But you can really make time to do this. I did this during every summer in law school. I took 10 days, and I went and did a sit. It is the way I survived law school. I was not happy in law school. And, um, and, and my 10-day sits really helped. Um, I also did a 10-day sit when I had a murder brief, a, a brief due in a murder case, and I was seven months pregnant. And when I came back, I was able to finish that brief 10 times faster than I ever would, and I'm definitely a better mother because of it. Labor went better because of it. Um, it um, you know, meditation helps me hold my seat when I'm confronted with suffering, mine and others. Um, and that's really what being a good restorative justice practitioner is all about. Um, it also requires being fully present with the totality of what people bring. And there's really, in my mind, no better way of doing that than developing a strong mindfulness practice. And like mindfulness, restorative justice aspires to bring out the full truth of the suffering we experience, and it offers a remedy in it at the same time. That is one of the most amazing parallels between those two uh, paths. And um, like the great insights of, uh, into sort of non-dualistic interconnectedness of all things that comes from sitting practice, restorative justice is itself embedded in these same notions of non-duality, right? It eschews the us, them, victor, vanquished mentality that reigns over our courtrooms. So for all these reasons, I'd encourage folks who are practicing either mindfulness or restorative justice or neither to, to take on doing both. And I think we have a little bit of time for questions if, uh, if folks have them. Thanks, folks. Do you have any questions? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, it was astounding. So it started as a capital case, first degree murder capital case. And um, the survivors, uh, Kate and a Andy uh, Gromare, uh, the parents of Anne Gromare, who lost her life, they were opposed to the death penalty. And they were not interested in, in that at all. And so that was off the table before we even got in the room, which was great, um, because that would have been a very hard thing to hold. Um, and I still think possible. Uh, so. Um, you know, he was looking at life, basically. And um, by the end, he, he ended up getting 20 years, in, in large part because of the um, advocacy, interestingly, of Anne's parents, Kate and Andy, were really invested in something that would heal the harm. And the kinds of things they were looking to have happen was that Connor, Connor McBride was the young man who took her life, that Connor would be released from uh, prison from time to time uh, in shackles to speak at high schools with them across the state about taking their daughter's life. So they want to be on stages with him, right? I mean, they're just astounding people. And this process helped them um, be able to come up with these kinds of outcomes, right? Um, other things that they want, I mean, they wanted him to do a ton of anger management and teen dating violence trainings. And it was really, um, and then they wanted him to be released sooner because as Kate said so beautifully, she says, now you have the good works of two people's lives to do. So you need to get out and do them. 
because Anne would have done great things. So this is an incredible burden you carry to do the good works of two people. So a lot of it was about Anne's favorite charity that he's going to volunteer his. I mean, really, it's just beautiful stuff. So uh, that was the outcome uh, 20 years and, um, and a, a whole lot of what Anne would have done with her life. And taking full responsibility for his behavior, which he did from the get-go, really, um, in this process, and, and speaking about it in public, being a, being a voice for ending teen dating violence. Yeah, yeah in back there. So a lot of it is listening, really just listening to people's concerns and then seeing what we can do to alleviate those concerns, right? So people have safety concerns, people have um, initially and you know, so what, what would make it safe for you? Really just continually, you know, so some people say, I want a police officer in the room. We're like, sure. You know, some people say, I don't want to participate and I'd like to have a surrogate be there. Can I send in my husband instead? Can I send in? And we say, sure. <laughs> you know? um, but we also just want to make sure um, what can we do to make this as amenable to you or your needs? Really just listening for what are your legitimate concerns and your, you know, whatever, I don't need to decide if they're legitimate or not legitimate. I just listen to concerns and do my best to meet them. So um, with young people, you know, what's amazing is this operates under an agreement with the district attorney's office that nothing that young people say can ever be used against them in a court of law. So uh, that promise and showing them that in writing from the district attorney uh, alleviates a lot of the fears on the other side. And then there's some kids who are just like, hell no, I don't want to meet the lady who's outside burglarized, and they're just not going to do it. And if they're not going to do it, they're not. I mean, if it's just too hard to sit down face to face with the person that you harmed, which that's like way harder than going to court, <laughs> you know, um, then they're not going to do it. But for the most part, the kids agree to participate. Yeah. Absolutely. Ah, okay, great. So really important to draw this big distinction between forgiveness and restorative justice. Restorative processes, I can't think of a better sort of cauldron for cooking up forgiveness than a restorative process, but we have zero expectations that victims forgive anything. A lot of victims come into this to get answers, to tell this person you know, screw you or whatever, you know, and, and, and sometimes, um, you know, they, they just say, or when they're meeting with the kids, there's not a whole lot of anger that comes out of the kids, um, <clears throat> but they really just want you to, the parents and the kids to figure out a way to pay back for the damage to the car that the, that the kid wrecked after the, so it's not all this beautiful spiritual process every time, right? The Gromares were a very unique case in a lot of ways, um, or not, I mean, there are a lot of cases that are, are beautiful like this. Um, <clears throat> I would say 25% of the cases are kind of transactional, or less, and 75%. Something shifts in the heart. It just kind of happens. Nobody walks in expecting that to happen. I think the Gromers did. Um, but for the most part, I, I, I see it over and over that there's hugging amongst people who I thought it was going to be totally transactional. you know. And by the time everyone gets in there, that just sort of happens. So how do we invite victims in, in a way? Again, really attending to their needs, right? And if their need is to not participate, no judgment, no judgment, right? Um, and I per personally prefer, as much as possible, victim-initiated processes. However, when, in some day, when this is the, the law of the land, right, when all cases go to restorative justice first for X set of crimes, that's just going to be what the process is. And so honestly, it's less time consuming than going to court. So, um, so in terms of putting victims out, you know, we do everything to not put victims out. We always work on their schedule. We don't say, this is when it's happening, you show up. We say, when can the victim do? It's always the victim first, always the person who harmed first. 
um, is a really important. And it's a big shift in the way in which we think about it. We're not thinking about how to punish this person. We're thinking about how to heal this. Right? That's a, that's a piece of it too. Thank you. Oh, we got this again. This is what? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just want to respect your time and maybe come up later. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, you bet. <laughs> Um, so there are some people here who have been attending our Social Justice Thursday series, and we've been talking about implicit bias, um, racial implicit bias, and gender implicit bias. And this coming week, we're going to start talking about social class uh, bias. And I would like you to carry what you heard here today in terms of mindfulness and bring that to um, our Thursday series and try to understand if in any way we could use um, kind of principles of mindfulness to become, uh, to overcome our implicit bias, uh, race, gender, and social class. Um, and the final announcement is um, please remember to speak to your financial aid counselor uh, before the end of the semester. And someone asked me why I'm telling you that. It's because many people feel that they can't go into social justice public interest work because they can't afford it. And we want you to understand that if you can, it is tough, but if you talk to your financial aid counselor and learn ways of managing debt or not taking on debt, it may help you uh, make a decision um, that you really want to make instead of making decisions that you feel like you have to make. Um, so uh, I see whoever comes on Thursday, I'll see you then. And uh, thank you all for coming. And please, let's give a now round of applause to Sujata. Thank you.